This isn't just a debate about security, not when the insurrection that Republicans don't want to investigate was trying to overturn the results of a free and fair election. And don't forget that the night before January 6th, the night before Donald Trump stopped the steel rally and the storming of the Capitol, Republicans narrowly lost both their Senate seats in Georgia's special runoff election. Ever since then, beginning in Georgia but extending nationwide, Republicans have looked for ways to make it harder for Americans to vote, especially black and brown Americans. All roads lead back to the Republican Party's unwillingness to defend, let alone embrace democracy. As we discussed on the show the other night. Do you believe a Republican-controlled Congress will allow a Democratic nominee for president who wins in 2024 to take office? Yes or no? Ruth. Uh, no. I don't. Um, the way things are going. No. <laughs> No, no, no. And, you know, with the laws that we're seeing in all of these states, if we saw a Democrat win handily, I think we would see enough states throw it to the uh, Republican Congress to overturn the results. Who better to continue that discussion with than two people who know how democracies die? They literally wrote the book on it. Joining me now are Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt. They are both professors of government at Harvard University and they're the co-authors of the New York Times bestseller, How Democracies Die. Thank you both for coming on the show. Uh, Stephen, let me start with you. When you both published your book in 2018, did you ever imagine there could be a violent insurrection at the Capitol within three years with supporters of a defeated American president trying to violently overturn the election result and the government itself? No, never imagined it. it uh, the, the authoritarian turn of the Republican Party has been much more rapid and much more thoroughgoing than we imagined when we wrote the book. Things are, are considerably worse than we thought. And Daniel, considerably worse, says Stephen. What is the state of democracy in America right now? And I wonder what would it have looked like had Trump won a second term? Well, I think... The good news is that our electoral institutions worked well enough for a Democratic majority to, to uh, retake the Senate, to maintain control of the House, and to take the presidency. That's the good news. The bad news is it barely worked. Uh, and we had a, a, the violence yes. on January 6th. And so I think that at the end of the day, we're in a very bad situation because it, a democracy requires two political parties in order to uh, survive. And we essentially have one Democratic political party at this point, and democracy can't survive with only one political party. Uh, exactly. Something I've been banging on about on this show, including this week. So I'm glad to hear you say that, though I'm also depressed uh, to hear you say that. Stephen, you say in the book that the Republican Party should, quote, build a more diverse electoral constituency and they must find ways to win elections without appealing to white nationalism, the sugar high of populism, nativism and demagoguery. That was 2018. This is 2021. They're doing the exact opposite, aren't they? They're doing the exact opposite. Yeah, um, it, Trump turned out to um, to be able to mobilize, I think, a, a higher number of core nativist voters than they than they expected. And the big problem, which I don't think we spent enough time on in the book, is that our electoral institutions are not creating an incentive for them to adapt because our electoral institutions reward sparsely populated territories, rural states. The Republicans are able to hang on to an awful lot of political power without actually winning majorities. If the Republicans had to go out and win 50 plus percent of the national vote, they would be forced to build that broader coalition. But they don't. They can win and have won and retain control of the Senate, the Supreme Court, and even won the presidency without actually winning elections. Yes, uh, that is definitely an inbuilt advantage they have both at the presidential level and the Senate level. Uh, minority rule is the name of the game. Uh, Daniel, you also had advice, both of you, for Democrats in your book. You said the Democratic Party could, quote, play a role in reducing polarization, even though you said they're not directly responsible or predominantly responsible for it, if they, quote, consider more comprehensive labor market policies and address the issue of inequality, too. I wonder, though, I hear a lot of people say that, including on the left and in the center, but I wonder, how would that counter the Republican stoking of racial resentment or the misinformation that comes out of, you know, Republican allied media like Fox News, which is pumping out, you know, propaganda about, you know, 
Trump having won the election or illegals having voted and the usual nonsense. You know, the Democratic Party can, you know, could become a populist party or a left wing party or whatever party you want to call it. But that still won't deal with the fact that Republicans can just go and cut themselves off and sit in an information bubble and be told night and day that Donald Trump won the last election. That, that's right. And, you know, I think Democrats have to use multiple tools in the toolkit. I mean, and I think in many ways what the Biden pres presidency is premised on the theory that by stimulating the economy, addressing COVID, making government work, that this can take out some of the anger from our politics. We'll see if that works. I mean, I, you know, I think that that is the best hope that we have at some level. That's certainly one part of the story. That's my guess is that that's not sufficient. I think, as Steve mentioned, our institutions uh, reward a bad behavior, essentially, from Republicans. They can maintain themselves in power without winning majorities. And so I think a second tool in the toolkit has to ultimately be in the long run to reform our democratic institutions. And this is part of what the democratic agenda is currently in the Congress. And so unless we take away, unless we change the incentives facing Republicans, and these are power-seeking careerists at the end of the day, uh, they're going to continue to behave the same way. So... So I'm glad to hear you say we have to reform democratic institutions. You both are professors of government at Harvard. You teach this stuff to a bunch of very bright students day in, day out. Tell our viewers tonight, both of you, Daniel, you can continue, Stephen, you second. What one institution, what structural fix, if you could wave a magic wand, would you make to American governance and the structure of American governance, either at federal or state level? It's all about sequencing. So I think the key thing is the filibuster. Until the filibuster itself is reformed in the Senate, everything else gets hung up. Then after that's changed, there's a whole set of other reforms that are possible. So that, that's where I would start. That's music to my ears. Stephen? Uh, two changes on the electoral front. And I'm not saying these are easy. Um, one, we need to get rid of the Electoral College. No no democracy, no presidential democracy on earth uses uh, yes. an Electoral College. We need to directly elect the president. And we need to change the way that we elect the Senate so that it's more proportionate to the population. Uh, and also we need to do something that all other established democracies in the world do, which is make it easy for all of our citizens to register and vote. There's no excuse for us not to have 75, 80% turnout as opposed to 50 plus percent turnout. Get rid of the filibuster, get rid of the electoral college. Regular viewers of this show will know I've been banging on about that for the last eight months. So you're both officially now my favorite professors from Harvard University. I wish one of you could go and talk to Kirsten Cinema. The other of you could go and talk to Joe Manchin. Life would be better in America. We'll have to leave it there. Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, appreciate both of you tonight. Appreciate your time. Thank you.